Aloha, and thank you for joining us, and welcome to A Better Day. I'm State Senator Sam Sloan, representing the 9th Senatorial District on Oahu, which stretches from Hawaii Kai down to Diamond Head and Waikiki. And it's our pleasure to bring you this program and try to give you some information and uh, some uh, things that you haven't thought about. Maybe we have a different point of view here and there, but it's a better day. Why do we call it a better day? Well, the governor says, you know, we'll have a new day and a good day and all of that. We want you to have a better day. We think that Hawaii has got so many positive opportunities, so many good people and so many resources, and yet they're undervalued. And we don't allow the free market to exist, and we don't allow a business climate to do its best. We think that we can do better, and that's what this program is all about. So for the next 25 minutes or so, sit back, enjoy this program, and hopefully we'll get you thinking. Hey, look, I've got a really special guest with me uh, today, and he's my friend and, and uh, old uh, partner and the former world surfing champion <laughs> and uh, a guy that's been involved in politics and energy and small business, just about everything you want. And he was even the grand marshal at the recent 4th of July <laughs> Kailua Parade. It's Fred Hemmings, surfer Fred. Welcome. A respectable surfer. A respectable yeah. surfer. Yeah. Hey, I got to tell you, I was on Kauai and uh, was shown some home movies of surfing in Mexico mm -hmm. and in Baja, Mexico. And they showed this place where there were like sets of seven continuous waves coming across. And these guys had some of the longest rides. They weren't big waves, but they were substantial was waves. Was it crowded? No, it wasn't that crowded wow. either. But they had long waves and all that. You still surf? I, I ride waves uh, mostly in a canoe when it's a little bigger. Uh, I still yeah. like the thrill factor of it. But Sam, uh, surfing is Hawaii's gift to the world. It's something that's indigenous to ancient Hawaii that really has become universal in practice. I just marvel at the, where they're surfing. Now, they're surfing all over the world. Yeah, if there's true. a wave breaking more, like there'll, be, <laughs> there'll be a surfer chasing it. Yeah. Well, and, and it's amazing, too, because, I mean, you are credited with really taking surfing to a different level. Yes. I mean, you had it on ABC TV. You had worldwide recognition. You made it into a sport where people actually get paid. You didn't get paid that much. Never won a cent. Uh, we, when you were surfing, we when you create, were a champion. We, yeah, we, yeah, I was given a nice trophy and a uh, handshake and said, hey, terrific, you're the world champion. But <laughs> I started professional surfing in the early 70s, and uh, people like Kelly Slater now recognize as one of the world's greatest athletes. Is, yeah. is, are, he's making millions. Yeah. yeah. And the women. And God bless him. The women, and particularly from Hawaii, and the, and the young girls are doing terrific, aren't Car they? Carissa Moore. Yeah. 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 World, world champion woman surfer, um, credit to Hawaii. Hawaii is generally considered the, the mecca of surfing, and for mm -hmm. obvious reasons. Not only have we pioneered surfing and the events of surfing and the founding of surfing, but uh, we're all still at seven mile magical uh, coastline from mm -hmm. Haleiwa to Kahuku is the, the best place. I mean, it's amazing. You can take something recreational. You can take something historical and all that. And you can make it into something where it creates jobs, it creates economic livelihood. Look at the people that are involved in these surfing, not only the, the contests nationally and locally and all that, but how it affects small business, how it helps people, how it creates employment and all of that, all from a sport and something you love to do. Well, Sam, I often say, and, and it's, not, it's unrecognized, and I'd like to see it a little more nurtured, uh, we still have a Department of Agriculture in Hawaii that spends a tremendous amount of taxpayers money with a whole government agency Department yeah. of Agriculture right. and I would venture to say and I hopefully could prove this out uh, that sports generates more gross revenue for the state of Hawaii than agriculture and when you look into the impact of the Hanul Marathon and all the other events plus the merchandising events mm -hmm. uh, you know, it probably does generate more gross revenue in the state of Hawaii than uh, uh, than agriculture, the the industry of the North Shore, I've always said, is, is surfing. It's not, you know, it's not anything else but surfing. It's, all, it's all known the, around the world. Yeah, exactly. People come just for that, just yeah. to to witness the the waves or yeah. to participate or, or anything else. And, and it really is a healthy component of, of our Hawaiian lifestyle, but it's also a healthy component of of, of business in the yeah. economic environment. It, you know, it's people are making good living off sports or sports related businesses, whether it's merchandising, sports science, sports medicine, putting on sport events. Yeah. Uh, it really is a healthy... And yet, and yet, you know, we, we give all this reverence to, to surfing in Hawaii and all of that. And I remember when you were in the state senate, the last thing that you had done, the last bill that you had introduced in the state senate had to do with establishing a surfing reserve in right. Hawaii to give, you know, further credence to what was happening. And you were on top of the wave, ahead of the wave, because you knew that other places around the world were doing the same thing. 
the, the bill passed in the Senate, and I remember on the last hour of the last The day, last bill on the agenda. The last bill in the State House, and they killed it. Uh -huh. And they killed it because it was a Fred Hemings Republican bill. To her credit, Governor Lingle uh, used an executive order to create it. What's happened since then with the surfing reserves? Well, the surfing reserve has become an international phenomenon. You know, we, we were one of the first to propose it here in Hawaii, and it's, it is so sadly ironic yeah. that the House members chose to politicize it and make a political issue. I was so proud of the Senate, you know, you know 25 sure. votes straight up, and it passed. It was the, truly bipartisan. It was bipartisan, right? healthy, good for, and it, it, it actually involved no money, but it got involved in petty politics in the uh, State House of Representatives and got shot down. In the meantime, other and it kind of gave us a black mark uh, yeah. around the world, especially the surfing world. I mean, you know? here we are. We started. Hawaii, it. You know, <laughs> know Hawaii it. says no, and they 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 they've done it in Portugal. They've done it in France, in the Basque Country uh, near Beirut. Uh, they've certainly done it in Australia. They're doing it in certain spots in Southern California. So it's really taken off internationally, and Hawaii, to its discredit, because of petty monopoly politics. Uh, made a made a negative thing out of it. It was pretty much the the handiwork of uh, one or two operatives and one guy in the private sector mm -hmm. uh, who didn't like it. So it, it, it really was a sad episode. But you know what, Sam? Something you said that I think is so important. In many ways, Hawaii's like a fallow field that's been laying dormant, and there's so much potential here. I mean, we have so many, especially in the area of business, because so many good things can happen here if we change the business environment. And mm -hmm. I just saw where that bastion of uh, what some people would call liberalism, uh, CNBC just ranked Hawaii 49th for business environment. Did you see that? Okay. I've seen that. I've seen other rankings. That must make you cry because you've been fighting for business your well, whole life. Well, you know, the question is why can you see this and I can see this and the people that we associate with see this, but the powers that control the state either don't see it or ignore it when we've got tremendous opportunities. And, and you know, all these rankings, like I say, they, they rank as 48th, 49th, 50th. The good news is our president has identified that there are 58 states, so we're not at the bottom. You know, we're no, he there. was he was off by one. I think <laughs> Sam, I think it was 57. 57. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see. <laughs> well, look, uh, along the same vein, um, you and I don't always agree on no. everything, and we shouldn't. We, and we shouldn't. In fact, we used to we used to drive people crazy in the legislature because we would disagree on each other's bills and, yeah. and, and vote against the uh. governor if we had been consistent. And I mean, that's what you really need, you know, is to look at things. But that's what checks and balances and, are all about. That's what it's all about, and to look at things objectively. Okay, there was a city council bill passed recently here in, in Honolulu that has generated a great deal of controversy. It did leading up to the final vote. I'm talking, of course, about Ordinance uh, Bill 11. And, and Bill banning, 5. And Bill 5. And Bill 5, and banning activities Commercial in Kailua activities. Beach. Commercial activities. And you're a Kailua guy. Uh, tell me about your feelings and, and what your position is on that. Well, uh, unfortunately, and, and, uh, first I want to talk about the isolated problem of Kailua than the larger problem. Sure. Uh, the isolated problem is that uh, Kailua is being taken over by tourism and commercial activities, and we're losing the residential character. Our property values are skyrocketing beyond our ability to pay for them because they're now commercial properties. They're being rented to tourists rather than the local people, and so, you know, how she could get, you know, uh, $2,000 a month for, for a local renter is can get thousand dollars a week uh, mm -hmm. or more uh, yeah. rented to a tourist. Uh, the the straw that's breaking the camel's back are the kayak renters and operators that are basically setting up their businesses on the beach and in the parks and and have taken over the beaches so we can't you know we can't even local people can't even go to Kailua Beach anymore mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, it culminated in Ikaika Anderson introducing a bill five and uh, to mm -hmm. mitigate it on weekends and certain periods and then, of course, Bill 11 takes commercial activity completely out of the parks and mm -hmm. off the beaches. It's a total ban. Total ban. And we support it wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. I just heard, and you're not going to believe this, there's going to be a press conference soon on it, that the, the police have been instructed by someone, quote unquote, in the uh, administration not to enforce the law. And uh, I've never heard of anything like that. I mean, when you make a law, the way to, to, yeah. to change the law is either the legislature or by the courts. But mm -hmm. you don't just unilaterally say, well, we're not going to enforce sure. the law. So it, it is a huge problem. And uh, that's the focused problem. But the larger problem, Sam, and this is a rhetorical question I asked several years ago and I introduced legislation when I was a senator, is what is a carrying capacity of tourism? I recall. And you remember that. And yep. so we can all say, well, you know, 10 million, 
Mm -hmm. uh, 20 million? Obviously, any reasonable person says there's going to be a line to draw. So the quest next question is, where do you draw the line? I happen to think that 7 million tourists is enough tourists a year. Mm -hmm. And what you can do is, is stabilize the, uh, cap the number of visitor accommodations. And we all know the laws of su supply and demand that you and I subscribe to, where right. the market dictates terms rather, exactly. than, rather than politicians. Mm -hmm. You, you restrict the, uh, cap the number of hotel rooms, that creates more demand for them. Uh, they become less tourist spending more money rather than the opposite, more tourists mm -hmm. spending less money. So it's economically good for Hawaii, it, it, it is fair and equitable, and it saves us from killing the goose that's laying the golden egg, because yeah. the goose is being killed in Kailua. Well, I think these are important issues, and they should be, you know, fully vetted and fully discussed, and people have their uh, opinions on them. Well, what, I, do you think, what do you think about well, that? Well, that's what I said. I, I, I differ only from this respect, and you know me. I'm uh, not a band guy. Yeah. Whatever it is, whether you're talking about plastic uh, bags yeah, or cigarettes, or I don't support bans because I, I think, first of all... But how about a cap? Will you well, say... A cap, maybe, yes. You and, know, 50,000 hotel rooms for Oahu, that's it. Well, you know, it, it's just like talking about housing. Um, you say, we need more housing for more people, but we don't have the infrastructure to support mm -hmm. the housing. And then until just very recently, we had a five-year moratorium on building anything, including additions to your own housing because of the city's inability to take care of the sewer system, water system. And just miraculously, during the last days of the mayoral campaign, uh, they lifted that moratorium and they said, oh, yeah, we can go ahead and build. I don't believe in, in, in doing that, and I do believe in... in uh, you know, usage that accommodates the local people, whatever well, that, that area. Then that's where you and have it. it was, so we're fine with that. It's yeah. just that when you talk about an outright ban, that, that's where I, well, I have a problem. Okay. I don't think one size fits all. Okay. And I think that you've got an opportunity to, to work within that to, to make adjustments. Well, but here we are. We're faced he, with Here's it. another thing that, that yeah. uh, I have been a proponent on being an ocean man myself. Yeah. Hawaii's greatest playground is, is, is the ocean. You know, it's where we surf. It's where we canoe paddle. It's where we do most of our recreation is sure. in the ocean. Sure. And that is ocean zoning. Mm -hmm. uh, you have it in Hawaii. We have it in Hawaii Kai. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a place where the jet skis can exactly. go. Exactly. And what we're doing now is we're piecemealing uh, problems. I remember Colleen Hanabusa had a problem out at uh, Waianae, and they remember they wanted the ban fishing boats out yes. and shark shark feeding at Makua. Right. And so we passed the bill special for that. We really need to have ocean zoning. We have an area where you can have commercial activity, recreational activity, just like land. Yeah. Because right now there's user conflicts and they're getting they're getting uh, contentious, you know, yeah. really and guys are threatening water the rage. Exactly. Yeah. Water rage. Yeah. Almost as bad as road rage. <laughs> and it's true. I mean in the time when you grew up you didn't have those kinds of problems, but, I, I, but now I, we do, so we have to do something about it. The only problem is you and I, I think, also further agree that every time there's a problem, somebody says, well, what's government going to do about it? And there's got to be other options and alternatives and mediation and, all, you know, and, and, and things to, to work because every time government does it, Cost Funny, more, it costs more and does less. It costs more. They find a way of botching it no matter what. They're going to find a way of, of screwing it up. And, and I think that this is unfortunate nationally and locally that we turn to government first and government has not delivered. Sam, I'll never forget when I was in the Senate and we were in the, one of the last days and uh, uh, you and I were talking about how proud we were that we didn't introduce a lot of laws because mm -hmm. the real problem is not enough laws, it's too many laws it's and, not enough, and, and not, not enough enforcement. That's right. And, and, uh, to her credit, uh, our good friend on the other side of the aisle, Donna Mercado Kim, said, "Oh, I'm going to join your team." I, I see <laughs> she wanted to get the, and, and it really is. It really underscores a much bigger problem here at the legislature, is that uh, we have too many laws and not enough enforcement, and we measure success by making another law and, rather than sure. <laughs> you know, enforcing. And everybody knows every legislator, regardless of party or regardless of House or Senate, they get calls from a constituent. And they say, my neighbor is doing this. I want you to pass a law. <laughs> and we get more about that. You don't like leaf blowers. You don't like the dogs. You don't like you know, all of that stuff. And yet, I think we're getting farther away from the purpose of government. And the purposes of government, you know, public safety and, and infrastructure, they're not doing that. Yeah. I mean, we talk about roads. Uh, John Pritchett had a wonderful cartoon in uh, uh, Honolulu Weekly a couple weeks ago. The, the city was bragging about, and they had a press release, they bought this new vehicle for a million bucks, and it's got cameras on top of it to spot the potholes. So Pritchard's cartoon showed this car you gotta surrounded be by potholes, right? Where are the potholes? Where are the, just go outside your door. Everybody can Just ask them. anybody anywhere on the potholes. A million bucks. 
you a million bucks, be yeah, th for this vehicle. Oh, so, you know, that, that's part of the problem. Another thing is, and, and you and I certainly have agreed about this in, in the past, but most of our colleagues don't, the beverage deposit bill, yes. which started out, it was supposed to be for Now the they want more money. It was supposed to be for the environment, uh, you know, get those pesky cans and bottles out of the landfill, even though cans and bottles at that time uh, what was it, about 10 years ago, at that time represented less than 5% of the landfill. But even so, they were worried that, you know, you'd be walking around the corner and a, and a stray can or a bottle would jump out, jump out you, you. along with a paper, a plastic yeah. bag oh, over oh, your head. What a bottle? So we, so we passed this law, not with our votes, because we voted against it, and we warned of unintended consequences. And one of those unintended consequences came home to roost in the, the last two weeks of July, and that was State Department of Health announced, guess what? Because you've been so good and diligent you at pay recycling, more. you're going to be punished. And the fee, which now they finally honestly refer to as a tax, is going to go up another half cent. So you're going to be paying more. And what are you paying for? You're paying for the administration of the Department of Health, more employees, their travel that time, their simple. administration. They can't even balance their budget, so they need more money. It has nothing to do with recycling. Sam, that, that, that's exactly what rating funds. You and I are at the legislature. We voted against rating funds. Yep. They take the money out of a special fund that's supposed to do a special project, devoted money for this. You voted against special funds for this. Every one of them. Every one of them for and you've been 60 consistent. years. Yeah. But they put it in the general fund so it can be there for collective bargaining uh, for public employees. That's the, yeah. the real reason behind rating funds. And, you know, it's... They've it's, taken, the, they, meaning the legislature, has taken about $12 million out of the recycling special fund. Hey, these special funds are not so special, no, right? They're, we, we they're taxes. Them up. They're, just, they're just... Whether, the, whether it's the Hurricane Relief Fund, whether it's the Rainy Day Fund, whether it's the Highway Fund, whatever it is, people think that the money is going in there for the purpose it's supposed to be. For example, the Highway Fund is to take care of the highways, the roads and highways. That hasn't been done, and it's rated at the state and the city level. You know, we have to be the source of, as we have always tried to be, Sam, uh, you know, from our side of the island perspective in governance, we have to be the source of solutions. And the real, the real debate that I lament has not been shifted in this country is everybody's talking about how to raise taxes. Yeah. We should really be talking about how to cut spending. Exactly. And, and you and I have consistently uh, been advocates of um, privatizing business uh, opportunities rather than having government run them, like this Maui Memorial Hospital is an economic abyss, mm -hmm. state health care system. You know, we know that you can incarcerate in a private prison on the mainland a uh, prisoner for half the price it costs to incarcerate him here. Bring private prisons here. You yeah. know, you want to solve the problem? You don't want guys flying to the mainland? Bring the prisons here. See, that's an excellent point that, that very few people have talked about. You know, it's not, the, it's not the issue of whether the prisoners are on the mainland or whether they're here. It is a cost issue. And when you're paying double, double, you know, double that's, that's the point. But if you could do it here, but then we get into the problem, where are you going to put it? Nobody wants it in their backyard. Nobody wants it over here. They don't want it. And now we have a, a, a public safety director, a new one, who actually is not new because he's been around for 25, 35 years. And everybody's worried about the prisoners. They're worried about, oh my gosh, they don't get the right diet, they don't get the right videotapes, they don't get the right exercise, legal, room. exercise room and all that. Nobody worries about the victims. And so public safety, which is a primary responsibility of, of government, is going by the, the wayside. You know that I served on that uh, judicial uh, reinvestment initiative. And I think it's important because there are things that you can do to make the court system and judiciary yeah, more efficient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think we can all agree on a number of those. But the idea of, of having early release, the idea of allowing people, well, it's not that serious a crime. He's only, you know, uh, broken into your property or stolen things 35 times. Yeah, well, you know? 36 in your own. 36 in your own. 36 in your own, right? right. We, we, have to, we have to hold accountable the government officials. Yeah. And people have to, we want them to vote. We want you to vote. Look, we used to be number one in the country in voting. Now we're number 50. I mean, that, that's an embarrassment. But you know, one of the good reasons that, that I often bring up to people who are apathetic about voting, yeah. it's the most expensive thing you pay for. Uh, according to Lowell Kalapa and the Tax that's, Foundation, that's true. 42 percent, I think is the last I checked, you yeah. probably are more Not your today. mortgage, not your car. Not your mortgage, not your car, not your well-being, not your kids. Yeah. It's you spend 40 percent. And what that really means, if you kind of just look at it from an average point of view, yeah. that in due wage or households, which Hawaii has the highest of, yeah. one of the parents is usually working just to pay taxes. That's right. It's crazy. But people don't realize that. And then you've got to send your kid to a private school if you really want to get a yeah. better education, if you're a certain area. So well, look, what I was going to say was, look, we want people to vote. We want to yes. make sure they're registered. We want them to vote. We want them to know the issues and all that. But look, 
when, when somebody comes knocking at your door and they want your vote, they want your money and all that stuff, don't ask them what high school they graduated from. Don't ask them who they're married to. Don't even ask them if they're Portuguese. Oh, no, you got to ask them. you got to ask Portuguese. Oh, because they're chosen race. Ask right? them about the issues. Where do they stand <laughs> on the rail, on taxes, on yeah. workers' comp, on beverage tax fees and things like One that? One of the things that I think uh, uh, you really hit the nail on is, is on taxes because this whole argument about taxes and spending is, is at the key of most of the other problems because yeah. government's gotten too big. It's bankrupting our country. And it's bank. You you see for the first time that I can remember, a lot of municipalities in, the, in California, especially, are going bankrupt. Yeah, cities are going bankrupt. That's true. And That's what happens true. when you run out of money? The first thing that most. I, I think that our a lot of our leaders here are in denial. Oh, it can't happen here. We're different. I mean, we always get that, right? Oh, Hawaii is different. We're not different. I mean, oh, you, you talked right, earlier about Ben's supply right and about, demand. Ben's right about the rail. Ben kind We of can't afford it. Well, bottom line is the bottom line. How can you afford a, a six to nine billion dollar rail with four billion in sewer repairs, three billion in water repairs, uh, untold billions in road repair. Right. Where's all that money coming from? We're a small state. We're a small island. We're a small population. And the idea is, you know, this last legislative session put back a lot of the cuts that had been made, you know, prior to. Uh, we put back personnel. We And 70% and of all of government's costs are personnel costs. Yeah compensation and benefits and all that. But Sam, we, we I mean, can't we, do it. We can't me, keep doing it. Exactly. And what, what, the, what some politicians will say that are part of the status quo is, oh, that's all right, we'll just increase taxes. Yeah. Well, we're, we're the most taxed municipality and state in the nation. I think we're third total as far as total tax burden goes. Yeah. And what happens is, what's happening here, uh, people leave Hawaii. The, the businesses leave Hawaii and say, we're not going to do business in Hawaii. We can't afford it. You know, the taxes are too high. Well, they either leave or they don't either start a business or expand a business. Oh, yeah. And you and I talk to a lot of people on a regular basis. They need help. They need extra employees, but they're not going to do it when they're getting socked with the taxes, with unemployment compensation, with workers' compensation, with TDI, with more employer mandates. And, and that's what the legislature says every year. Well, you should be paying this, and you should be giving that, yeah. and all that. I would like to see every legislator uh, open and operate a business for six months and be responsible, you know, to turn a profit or to meet the payroll. Because most of our colleagues, God bless them, we love them, and they're, they're good people with good ideas, except they've never met a private payroll in their lives. And by the way, when we talk about jobs, we're not talking about creating more government jobs, more public jobs. We're talking about private sector jobs, where it adds value, it adds additional resources and things like that, and we're not doing that. And we certainly aren't, and it's, it's long overdue. And the problem we have, of course, is if you're a businessman, you, just as you well know from, from your personal business, yep. is you're not going to hire people here because you don't know what the future holds. And you, you, I, you know, I tell people all the time, those of us that have a business background or business experience, it's not that we're any better than anybody else. It's just that our experiences are different. And if we screw up and it's our dime, it's our name, you better believe we're not going to do it a second time and we're not going to charge anybody else for it. We've got to live and be responsible yeah. for that. Sam, there's no limit on the creation of prosperity and wealth when it's done with risk and with private enterprise. There is As a, long as there's incentive at the end of that yeah, rainbow, right? But there is a risk yeah. on dependency and uh, poverty, and that risk is called bankruptcy. Yeah. Eventually, if you have people dependent on government, you're going to bankrupt the government. Well, because yeah, and not, not only that, you know, we always used to talk about we said welfare to work, the idea being, okay, if you need some temporary assistance or whatever, fine, but the objective is to get to work, to have a job to, to be self-sustaining. Right. We've made the, the, the welfare benefits so attractive. Why work? And, and, and the underground economy, why work? That's right. Exactly. And so a lot of people, I mean, if they can be on, on subsistence for you know, six months, for a year, how about for free, two years. How about free gold medical, gold-plated uh, medical care? Well, there you go. And you, and you don't have to show your assets. You can have yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars in assets. It's just earned income. Okay, don't show your assets because we have oh, yeah, children Oh, it's a mixed company here. All right, we're, we're, we're coming to the end of a program. Yes. What, what words would you like to leave with, with the audience about a better day? Well, there is a better day, and, and, and that will start on November 6th if you choose to do so. And I think the real issue here is the status quo versus change. There are good people that wish to bring to the table some honest change, and it's going to take all of us working together. Hawaii abounds with opportunity, but doing the same thing and expecting different results, 
has proven not to work. So I would say the best thing people can do is, you know, elect people that are going to generally implement honest change and not the status quo. Yeah, we, I mean, absolutely, we are bullish on Hawaii. We know what the future can That's be. Right. We've got people all over the world that would love to come here and do business because we've got a politically stable environment, we've got all of our natural beauty and all that, but hey, you know what? Natural beauty doesn't get the job done. Yep. You've got to have the, the ability to not only create and maintain jobs, but also to provide those incentives. We can do it here yeah, in Hawaii. We sure can. You know, we're still getting stories right now about uh, the economy has turned the corner, we're really revving up, and that may be true in certain sectors and, and for certain businesses, but we're still struggling. Everybody knows they're struggling, and every time they go to the store or get their uh, monopoly electric bill yeah. or the water bill or the sewer bill or, or pay gas, you know, this idea that, oh, it's the paradise tax, we should be paying 40% more than the mm -hmm. mainland. No way. So, we leave you with this positive thing. Get up on the issues, learn about the candidates, get involved and vote, but vote, you know, from a standpoint of knowledge and asking people exactly where they stand on those issues. And until we see you the next time, we know that we are going to have a better day. And we want to thank Fred thank Hemmings. You. And Fred, what do you always say on your on your surfboard? Imoa. <laughs> and slide right. <laughs> slide right, exactly. Slide right. Take off on the big ones and slide right. If you have any <laughs> questions or comments about uh, this program or about anything that we can do, please contact me directly, State Senator Sam Sloan. I'd be very happy to talk to anyone and to try to answer any of your questions. Um, we know that it's going to be a better day. And thank you so much for joining us again on this program. Aloha.